If you are looking for ways to inspire your kids to greatness this school year, I hope you'll tune in today. I have a very exciting show for parents, and I have a special guest, Stacy Bauer, on the show. By the way, this is the Coffee and Kidlet Show, and I like to champion children's book writers who are putting out books that inspire kids to, to many things. And I hope you'll tune in. If that's something that interests you, please hit the subscribe button and tune in today as we talk to Stacy Bauer. Um, Stacy is the, uh, sorry, let me switch screens here. Stacy is the author of a brand new series called the Young Change Makers series. Stacy, thanks so much for coming to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Absolutely. Now, can you just give us a little bit of a background on you? Because I know you've you've had your your feet in a few different places. So just just tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm from a suburb just outside of Minneapolis in Minnesota. Um, I have two kids, Cammy and Wyatt. Cammy's 12 and going into seventh grade, which is insane. And Wyatt is 10 and he's in his last year of elementary school here. Um, in Minnesota. And I'm also a teacher. So I have taught uh, all the kindergarten all the way up to eighth grade math. Um, I taught for 17 years. And um, I've, also, I've always wanted to be an author, like a lot of self-published authors out there. I've been writing since I was a kid. And so um, a few years ago, I decided to see if I could actually make a go of it. And I, I dove into the self-publishing world. That's awesome. And and you you have quite a few books out just in the past four years, I believe, which is really impressive. Um, so how was it to transition from being a teacher to being an author? You mentioned that it's something you've been wanting to do for a while. But um, did you decide to to leave teaching and then the idea of writing a book came up or was it something that you decided to pursue right away as a so teacher? Yeah. So what happened was, um, now I have to think back to five years ago, which is like, <laughs> uh, what happened yesterday? I don't even know. Um, so I was actually uh, teaching part time. Um, I was teaching part time kindergarten for four years and a position opened up at my school. Um, we, we had every other day kindergarten in Minnesota for a while. And I thought, what a great opportunity. I wonder if I should do this because I could be home with my kids um, twice a week. And then I could be, I could also teach, which I love and I could do that twice yeah. a week. Um, so I took that position and, um, my last year in that position, my son st had started preschool and I was home with him on his days off, but then I was teaching part-time. And that's when I remember thinking, you know, I've always wanted to write a book and I'm part-time teaching right now. My son's in school part-time I should see if I can do it. And that's when I kind of started with my, you know, rough draft of Cami Kangaroo has too many sweets. Um, so like many, many, many authors out there, I wrote my rough draft. And then of course I had no idea what to do. I had no idea what I was right. doing. I didn't know any authors. I didn't know any illustrators. I just had no clue. I thought I had to find, um, you know, a traditional publisher or like an agent or something. And I didn't know anybody or anything. And so um, I reached out to my family and friends and I asked them if they knew any authors. And my sister had actually gone to school with someone who had just started her own publishing company um, and published her own book. So I reached out to her. Her name's Lindsay. And we had breakfast and she kind of helped me get going in the self-publishing world. And and, um, you know, four years later, five years later, here we are. And it's but it but as far as the transition goes. Um, I did go back to teaching the following year full time. So I was teaching full time um, because in the state of Minnesota, the kindergarten um, went to everyday kindergarten. So I didn't have a choice. I came back full time yeah. and I was trying to figure out my first book. So that was crazy because I and I had two little kids. They were seven and four. So I was trying to like teach full time, go pick up my kids from daycare, be with them. And then at like you know, eight o'clock at night when they went to bed, I would work on my first book. And I ran my first Kickstarter that that uh, February also. And then um, let's see, I did that for a, I worked for a couple years when I was uh, being an author. And then um, I my position got cut in second grade. And so I could either go back to kindergarten or 
um, I could take a leave. And in Minnesota, you can take a five-year sabbatical and still have your position. So my husband oh, was, wow. you know, my husband totally supported me. He's like, go ahead and take a leave, follow your author dream for a year, two years, five years, whatever. And yeah. then when that time is up, we can decide what you want to do. So I actually have two years left. And then I have to decide if I'm going to, you know, um, try to find a teaching position again, or if I'm going to do this author thing full time. So I've been kind of in a rush, like, because I've only have this like small amount of time to really spend full time on my author career, you know, and then I have to kind of decide, I don't know if I want to give up teaching because I love teaching too. So um, mm -hmm. I've been really lucky that I've been able to do both of the careers that I've always wanted to do. So yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. We were talking a little bit before we went live that I've just been so impressed by your work ethic. And now I know you're trying to fit it all in within those yeah. five years. <laughs> Uh, I've been kind of following you for the past three years, ever since I wrote my first book, Ada and the Helpers, and we're in some of the same uh, author and illustrator groups on Facebook. And and so it just, it's been fun to kind of see your journey along with um, the uh, Cami and Wyatt kangaroos. Um, so tell us a little bit, because I know you, you kind of do a lot of things now as an author, you're doing a lot of uh, author visits and virtual author visits. So I'm sure some of your career as a teacher has kind of prepared you for being an author. Could you mm -hmm. just share a little bit about that, how you felt like that prepared you? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I feel like I have read a lot of kids books. Um, so when I'm talking to people and I'm about being a kid's author, I always recommend, you know, you need to, you need to read some kid's books if you haven't already. So, you know, go to the library or just buy some books and read them. But, you know, as a teacher, I have probably read thousands of kid's books. So I feel like that has prepared me in a lot of ways because, um, I know the importance of a book cover because I have, mm -hmm a lot of kids books and I, I've read a lot of kids books. Um, I've read a lot of different styles of books and, and seen the way that they are kind of laid out and all of that. So I feel like that kind of was like the number one thing that prepared me for um, diving into the self publishing world. And then, yeah, um, I have a lot of uh, contacts in the teaching world. And so my first year when I published Cami kangaroo has too many sweets, I think it was 2018 the book came to me in May and I did a month of free um, school visits because I felt like I only have one book. You know, I don't really this is my first month doing it. I don't feel comfortable charging. And so I reached out to a lot of my teacher contacts and just said, hey, um, I'm doing, you know, free author visits for a month. Do you want me to come into your classroom? And of course, they were like, yeah, of course, that'd be great. So yeah. um, I spent that month going in. And so um the other way it's prepared me is my presentation. So what I do is I have, I present for about 45 minutes or so, depending on the age of the kids. Um, I know to differentiate, you know, if I have preschoolers, I'm not going to talk for more than like, you know, 20 minutes <laughs> or so. Right. Whereas if I have, I've done middle school before and I can present for more than an hour because obviously their attention span is longer and they want to dive more into the world of like marketing and, and, um, you know, publishing and all of that, whereas the preschoolers just want to be read to and maybe talk to a little bit about how I wrote the book and my kids and all that. So, um, you know, my experience as a teacher has taught me that I need to differentiate with the kids and and be flexible with the presentation and really involve the kids, too. So when I'm presenting, I'm not just talking I'm asking questions. I'm asking them to respond back by raising a hand or giving a thumbs up or talking to their neighbors. So a lot of those like classroom management type things that I've mm -hmm. been trained on, I use that during my presentation. So I'm always moving around the room. Um, I have a, a Google slideshow that I put together that talks about um, the writing process because I know that teachers, you know, they don't just want me to read a book. They want me to talk about like, you know, I use the same writing process that you're using in your in your class. Like I, I write a rough draft. I edit the story like a hundred times and the kids are always shocked because I know as a teacher, they don't want to edit at all. They just want to be, Oh, I'm done. I wrote my story. I'm all yeah. done. And, it, and I tell them, no, that's not even me. I edit at least a hundred times. Um, you know that. 
Jesus. Right. <laughs> this is like, well, by, by the way, I, I, I should just mention that I am Stacy's book designer yes. for this series that we'll be talking about. So that's what she's referring to. Yes, uh, yes lots of edits, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's part of the process, right? Right, exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's prepared me, teaching has prepared me for, um, you know, becoming a writer, managing um, the kids when I'm doing my presentation and then how I do my presentation at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't your first series. Um, could you just kind of tell us a little bit about the first series that you worked on? Um, oh, sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll um, get into Young Change Makers in a minute. Yeah. So this is, uh, these are a couple of the books in my first series. Um, so when I first became um, decided to kind of dive into this world. It was because, well, I've always wanted to be a writer, but um, I had been posting uh, stories about my kids, mostly Cammie, because she's quite a character, pun not intended. But um, <laughs> I've been posting lots of stories about her on Facebook about stuff that she says or does because she's just She's just, you know, interesting. And so people are always telling me, you should write a book. Your kids are so funny. They do such funny things. And, and I was always like, oh, yeah, ha, ha. You know, I should. I've always wanted to write a book. So then when I decided to do it, I thought, I am going to write a book about my daughter. You know, and I, I have a lot of the Berenstein Bear, Bear books. And so I thought maybe I'll do a series kind of like that where I, my kids are the characters and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I made a list of like all the stuff they've done and kind of what the lesson it could teach. So like the too much screen time and then, you know, my daughter's messy room and I have the one about her sneaking treats and, and I felt like those are really relevant things that a lot of kids and adults struggle with. I always tell kids I eat unhealthy. Sometimes I have too much stuff. I have too much screen time. I have the same struggles that my kids have. And so um, that's kind of where the idea came from. And so um, I decided to turn my kids into kangaroos because I thought it'd be fun for Cammie to have the pouch and, and everything. And I wanted to use an mm -hmm. animal just so that every kid could kind of relate, you know, and anywho, I don't know. I'm kind of the one regret I have is I wish I wouldn't have named them after my kids. They, at the time, my daughter was fine with it because she was seven. But now yeah. that she's 12, she's not too excited about being uh the main character in my books anymore so but you know it is what it is and it happened and she'll be fine with it and as she gets a little bit older and gets more confident in herself i guess but yeah i was going to ask you about that because i remember when you posted about your kids not yeah. being so excited about yeah. being the the center of attention in your books and and that's when i think you started introducing the koalas in the yes. story and i thought maybe yeah. you would do sort of the spin off and maybe that's your idea for the future i don't know um but so now you have the young change makers series which is completely different from the kangaroos so tell us a little bit about what this new series is about. Yeah. So um, about a year and a half ago, I was trying to, because I have published um, eight books in the Cammie and Wyatt series. And I still have one book left in my contract with Rebecca, my illustrator for that series. So I, I am going to yeah. do at least one more Cammie and Wyatt book. But I was thinking, you know, I could do another Cammie and Wyatt book, but I just really had it on my heart. I kept like getting this recurring thought about doing something more, like doing something. Um, and it was in the midst of COVID. So like people were kind of down and, and you know, kind of, I guess, hopeless and just kind of depressed and not, not feeling, you know, the happiest that they've ever been. And so I was trying to think, how can I use my author voice um, to just encourage people and to inspire people for the future and I was looking through all my books that I have at home and in my classroom. And I realized that, you know, I have a lot of books um, about people making a difference, but it's mostly adults or famous people or historical people that have made a difference in these books. And I thought, you know, what if I could find kids who, and I, I knew there are kids out there who are doing really cool stuff. What if I can find some kids and I could feature them in a book? That would be really neat because it could show other kids that it doesn't matter how old you are. You can make a difference. It doesn't matter how big of a difference you're making. One little 
act of kindness can, you know, creates a ripple effect and it can affect so many people. And we talk about it in my classroom, like every day, you know, how acts of kindness, just do one thing, smile at someone, say hi, open a door, say good morning, whatever. Um, and then that person can go like pay it forward, you know? And so I thought I'm going to see if I can find these kids. So I created a graphic and I posted it on my social media that I'm looking for these kids who are doing things to help um, change their communities. If you know anyone, let me know because I want to write a book. So I thought I'll find like 10 kids. <laughs> well, you know what happened? <laughs> um, uh, people started sending me. They started tagging me on, on news posts. They started uh, sending me emails and messages on um, social media saying, oh my gosh, my neighbor's kid is out there selling lemonade and they donate all the money to charity. And mm -hmm. oh, you should see what this kid is doing with his artwork. And oh, look at this person. And I was just like, okay, so this this is a valid idea. I can find enough kids. And of course, I couldn't say no to anybody. So it turned into like a seven book series. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm still getting, I could write like five more. So stay tuned, wow. Travis. Travis is like, oh God, no. <laughs> No, no more. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it's it, the rest is history, I guess, because I I then interviewed um, illustrators and and I found Emanuela, who has been amazing to work with, and so um, we did the Kickstarter for the first three books last summer, and these are the first three. So I ended up uh, dividing the kids up um, according to what their focus is. So I have kids who. Um, focus on helping the animals. So, you know, with the paw print here and I have kids who focus on helping the environment and I have kids who really have something that they're um, really interested in and they focus on just following that dream. And then I have kids who are focused on helping people. And so I decided to kind of do, you know, 12 kids per book to keep the page at about 40 pages and uh, ended up being seven books so far and so yeah it's been an incredible experience meeting these kids and and i've gotten to talk to several of them virtually um it's they're just i just can't say enough about how awesome they are they're just so uh generous and compassionate and passionate about what they're um you know what they're doing to change their community so it's just been it's been inspiring for me and it's really changed my outlook of the world and really um given me hope for the future too yeah, absolutely. Same for me as as the designer. I, I get to read these stories before they're yeah. out. And and um, I'm an emotional guy. I'll be honest. It doesn't take <laughs> much to make me cry. And some of these stories did it for me. Yeah. You know, it's like they, they just have they're just so inspiring. And um, yeah. I think it's fantastic. You know, we went from probably a dozen kids to 84 different mm -hmm. stories in these seven books. And, and uh, you've been teasing that this was the end, but I, I have the truth here now that there could be more coming. <laughs> I just got an email yesterday from this uh, Dante, who is um, one of the head people from the uh, Giving Tuesday Sparks program. I don't know if you've heard mm -hmm. of that, but it's uh, Giving Tuesday. And then Sparks is like the kids who are a part of that. And he emailed me and said, I have a whole new batch of kids for you. If you want to write another book, I'm like, oh, gosh. I said, let me see if I can get these last two books funded first on Kickstarter. And then I'll get back to you. Because I basically my plan was I was going to finish the series after book seven. And then maybe do one more Cami and Wyatt book. And then just focus on marketing. Because marketing is like, you know, marketing is like a full-time job in and of itself with um, being an author. And so mm -hmm. I just, I'm like, I, huh, this pace of, you know, pu putting out books and trying to market at the same time and trying to be a mom and a wife and a whatever, getting stuff done around my house, which <laughs> taking a bath <laughs> burger. Um, and then going back to you that a year or two is just, it's too much sometimes. So anyway, we'll yeah. see what happens. Yeah. Well, um, I want to take a look at your Kickstarter um, because that's uh, that's what's happening right now. You're you're running this crowdfunding campaign for the last two books, as you mentioned, Dream Chaser, Dream Chasers, and Leading mm -hmm. the Way. You've got yeah. 16 more days to go. Um, 
can you just give for those of you who are watching who have maybe never heard of Kickstarter, could you just give a quick little description of what that is? Yeah, sure. So Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform where um, if you have a creative idea, like an invention or a book or a, a you know movie or a song or a game, and um, you have an idea and you need the funding to kind of bring it to life, you can put it on this platform, this Kickstarter.com. So you create a video, you create a campaign, um, you create reward levels. And um, it's not, I always tell people it's not a donation. You're basically partnering with someone to help them bring their project to life. And in return, you can get a reward. So people can pre-order your book. People can um, pre-order the, the whole series. There's different reward levels that people can pledge to. And in return for mm -hmm. their pledge, they get they get different things like the ebook or the books or a virtual author visit and things like that. Yeah, and um, you actually have a special reward tier going on right now just for 48 hours. Um, yeah. And that's uh, for $48, mm -hmm. you can get the whole series of seven books in paperback mm -hmm. um, and free shipping in the US, I believe it is. Uh, so that's, that's a, an amazing deal. Um, she's holding up a paperback now. It's it's a little bit smaller than the yeah. uh, the hardcover, but uh, still a great size. And, yeah. Um, well, the paperbacks are nice because um, they fit, you know, better in kids' backpacks or like mm -hmm. I always tell people, it's not really to start shopping for Christmas. These are would be great great uh, great stuffing uh, stuffing socking stuffers. <laughs> and then um, in the back, we added this little section where kids can create an action plan um, and kind of map out how they're going to change their community if they have if they're inspired to do so so we added that um, only to the back of the um, paperbacks so yeah this is a great option if you know a teacher or you know some kids who would like these books these would be a great gifts for teachers classrooms too Absolutely. And I was also thinking for uh, homeschoolers, if they want, yes. you know, that's pretty much a, a whole curriculum and how to inspire kids to to do things in their community and, and things like that. So um, it's definitely worth checking out. By the way, if you are interested, the link to the Kickstarter is in the description of, of this video. I also have links to all the books that are available on Amazon right now if, you're, if you want to see those. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, yeah, I encourage you to go to the Kickstarter, check out these books. I'm going to share again the screen here because we can see the pages inside a little bit more. Um, like you mentioned this, this is, uh, this is Adam. He's uh -huh. part of the inspirational icons, um, category. And, and with each kid you have, uh, like a quote from them as well as their story and what they've been doing. You have uh, some fun facts. So you, we get to learn a little bit more about their personality and kind of what they enjoy doing as well as how, how the reader can get involved in either the same organization or do something similar. Um, and, and, and then some, some advice from the, uh, the kid that's in the uh, feature. So really great information from each kid. And like I said, 84 different stories in this series of seven books. It's, it's really incredible, Stacey. Um, we have more questions coming up, but I, I do want to go through a little bit of a lightning round with you. These are questions that I did not give you beforehand. <laughs> I've done um, this before on these shows. <laughs> yeah. I'm not good at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So, it is the coffee and kid lit show. Are you a coffee drinker? No, I'm not. You're not. You're the second one. I believe the second one that's come on here saying you don't drink coffee. I'm actually a fairly new coffee drinker. I think that's okay. okay. What do you drink instead of coffee? Well, so this is my, so this is going to sound really, okay. This is going to sound maybe too much information about me, but I, so I, have, <laughs> I, I experience uh, chronic pain. I have fibromyalgia. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I, try really hard to cut out like sugar and gluten and all that stuff. So I'm on a special, um, I'm on a special diet right now. So I have a special uh, chocolate shake that I drink every day for breakfast. There you go. <laughs> so that's what I drink. Coffee that sounds better than coffee. <laughs> caffeine, caffeine is like, 
really, I'm really sensitive to caffeine. So if I drink it or eat it, I can't sleep at night. Even if I do it at like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, it still affects me too much. Yeah. So I, I try to stay away from caffeine if I can. Um, I want to see if you can name all seven books in the series. Oh God. Within can we 10 start seconds. right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Making a difference, inspiring others, compassionate kids, uh, champions for change, heroic kids, um, dream chasers and leading the way. I had to think about the last two for a second because I'm not used to talking about that as much. <laughs> Piece of cake. Piece of cake. It's a lot easier for you as the author than it is for me. I'm constantly forgetting. What, what is that? What's number five? <laughs> well, you have seen yeah. a lot of, you've seen and worked on a lot of books, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, what was your favorite book as a kid? You know, or series it, I know or this is a lightning round, but I'm not going to talk super fast. But <laughs> no, <laughs> um, no, no. It's, but, yeah, it's not meant for that. Yeah. Okay. A lot of kids ask me this when I do school visits, and it's hard because I love to read. Like, even now, reading is like my favorite thing to do. I have read so many books. Um, so I don't have a favorite book, but I loved the Babysitter Club series, which is funny that they're out now as graphic novels because my daughter reads the graphic novels. So it's just weird seeing them as graphic novels. Cause when I was a kid, I read them all, like all the paperback um, chapter books. So I have read those. I read um, Laura Ingalls Wilder. I read, what else did I read? I, those are probably, those are like the two series that kind of stand out right now as the ones that I read over and over again. You know, it's funny. I, I like to go into um, like thrift stores and and look at stuff that I could possibly buy and resell. I don't do too much here in Norway, but um, I still like to go into these thrift stores. And, and I've started noticing some of these old series from when we were kids, like the Babysitter's Club series in, in Norwegian and the Hardy Boys oh. series in Norwegian. Oh. And, and they're the original books from, you know, decades ago. So it's, it's kind of neat. Um, so can you read so, those? <laughs> let's not go there <laughs> i have trouble reading picture books to my kids in, in norwegian <laughs> yeah I, I understand my kids are in chinese immersion school and i oh, uh, i don't know any i don't know any mandarin so <laughs> yeah, yeah. i studied norwegian i took some you know adult classes for it but i, I just don't get the practice for it like yeah. i should and um yeah. you know all of my clients are uh, either in the U S or other parts of the world. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. but, uh, that's the way it goes anyways. Yep. Um, what now your kids are a little bit older now. What was the last book you read to them? My son and I actually, my, my daughter's 12. She reads to her. She doesn't really want me to read to her that much anymore. So I don't, but my son is 10 and I read to him every night still. So I'm actually yeah. reading, um, What's, oh, Maze Runner. Have you read that one? The Maze Runner I series? No. So it's about these uh, boys who are in this like big glade field thing surrounded by a big wall and outside the brick wall, there's a maze and they're trying to figure out like how to escape the glade out of the maze. And anyway, it's a, it's a like eight book series or something. We just finished book one. So he's excited to go on to book two. So with him, I, I, he reads to himself, but he also likes it when I read to him at bedtime still. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to get back into the questions about the Young Change Makers series. And um, you kind of answer this a little bit. And it seems like most of these stories are coming to you rather than you having to go out and, um, and find these kids. But what was it like to sort of put these stories together? Um, you know, you're collecting your, I'm sure you have to ask the kids or their families parents questions and and put the could you just kind of talk yeah. to us a little bit about that process yeah sure so i did find some of the kids i went on instagram and i used hashtags like um kid activists and inspiring kids and i found um a whole slew of kids on there so i did go out and find about half of them and about half of them were brought to me um so the first thing i did of course is reach out to the parents or guardians because they are all under some of them are some of them are older than 18 now, so I could just get their permission. But if they're under 18, I had them sign a waiver saying that they're okay with being in the book and using their photograph um, and telling their story. Um, and then, you know, asking their parents if they're even interested in having their child in a book. And I, you know, I didn't hear back from some of them. 
Um, about half, I would say, uh, wanted to be in the series. Um, and then, yeah, basically to write the stories, I came up with a list of questions to ask, um, you know, like, how old are you? How old were you when you started? Where are you from? Um, what motivated you to get started? Uh, what was the hardest thing about what you're doing? Who helped you? You know, that kind of thing. And I emailed the questions over um, to the parent and then the parent and the child kind of answered the questions and they sent them back. And then as I was writing them, um, I wanted to make sure I had everything updated and all of the um, research was accurate. So I, a lot of the kids have websites or they're on social media. So I would refer to their websites or just Google them and read other news stories about them and kind of fill in the gaps as far as what I needed. And then, and then when I was done with the rough draft, I sent it to the parents and asked them to read it for accuracy and just let me know if they want anything changed. And then after that, it went to the editors and then it went to you. So it's a, it's a quite a different process than the Cami Kangaroo books because it's, it's nonfiction. So it's like, you know, I'm an, I'm a reporter and I need, I'm interviewing people and I need to make sure that everything is right. And like some of these kids, um, I sent them questions in April of 2021 and I'm not publishing their book until now. So I had to make sure that, okay, it's been like a year and a couple months. Are you, oh, they've raised 20, 20,000 more dollars now. So I have to make yeah. sure that everything is, you know, up to date and, and accurate. And, you know, they're not in juvenile detention or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> None of these kids are. They're all awesome. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so tell us uh, maybe a couple of stories that you feel like have really impacted you or, or really stand out in, in your mind from the series. Um, yeah, so I can just highlight a couple of the kids here. So in the first book, you know, we've got Ava. So I'll turn my computer here. Hopefully people can see. Yeah. Ava is from um, North Carolina and uh, she is a child that um, she wasn't doing well in school. She wasn't doing well in reading and math and she was struggling, but she really enjoyed science. She liked doing science experiments and she found out that um, you know, some, some kids aren't really into science or don't like it that much. And so um, she created this YouTube channel where she would do lots of experiments on YouTube and she got it out in front of like, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of kids worldwide. And, and so that really helped her come up actually past grade level in reading and math because she started um, reading about science and science experiments. And, and so doing this helped her and inspires other kids too. Um, Justin, uh, loves frogs. It's his favorite animal. And what's interesting too, on this journey is that I've learned a lot <laughs> about, um, th I've learned a lot about animals and the environment from these kids that I didn't know. Like, I didn't know that frogs are actually indicator species and they can, they actually drink and like breathe through their skin. And so if frogs aren't doing well, if they're like, you know, endangered or something, that's an indication that our environment isn't doing well either, which I didn't know that. So um, I learned it from Justin. And so um, Justin's passion is uh, helping to save the frogs. And and because he does that, he's helping the environment at the same time. So it was, it was interesting for me to learn that. Um, and then we've got, gosh, there's, I could talk about every kid here because I just, I all of them are just amazing. But um, May Lee, she's, she was born with spina bifida, so she's in a wheelchair. Um, she loves dancing and music. And so her and her mom started their own wheelchair dance team for kids like her who are in wheelchairs um, but want to dance. And she also, um, at the age of like eight, she went to her uh, city council and talk to the mayor, which is just blows my mind because I would be nervous doing that. And I'm a grown up. Um, but she talked to them about adding ramps to all of the playgrounds in her area so that, you know, everybody could play in the playground. They could be accessible. Um, and so it happened. Ryan uh, is passionate about the environment and about recycling. And he started his own recycling company when he was three, which just is like, what? Wow. But yeah, when he was three, 
he started picking up litter and his dad actually took him to the recycling center and showed him um, how they recycle things. And so he started his Ryan's Recycling Company. And um, he has a website where it shows like how many plastic bottles he's recycled. And it's like in the tens of millions of plastic bottles. And so he goes to the beach. Um, he lives in California. He goes to the beach every week and just picks up trash bags full of like broken um, beach toys that are left behind. And so again, he's helping animals at the same time because um, they're not ending up in the ocean and, and harming animals and cluttering up the ocean. So those are just a few of the kids from the first book. But like I said, there's, there's kids who are doing everything that you could think of to help um, animals and people and the environment. And I could talk about, I'm really passionate about it. I could talk about all of them, but we don't have time. So <laughs> you'll have to read the books. <laughs> exactly. And I think those are the stories that have really impacted me the most reading through these books are the ones that dealt with recycling, collecting plastic from the oceans, that sort of things. I mean, you've got kids who are doing simple things like walking on the beach and picking up trash to those who are inventing robots that float in the ocean yeah. and pick up plastic. I mean, it's just that really, awesome? just really incredible. Yeah. yeah. And they're not just collected all in one book. These are like stories that kind of follow the same theme throughout the whole series, you might say. And, and that's, that's just really incredible. And, and I, I think, you know, my mind's kind of going um, towards homeschooling because we're thinking about homeschooling potentially in the future. But even as parents, if we want to encourage our kids to, to start thinking about how they can better the world, you know, that, that can be a daunting task, yeah. <laughs> you know, to try to encourage our kids to be that way. But but it's so easy with this series. Just open up a book, read a few stories yeah. to them and see what kind of grabs their interest. Mm -hmm. And then you could it, they get interested in frogs. And so then you can kind of explore that a little bit more yeah. and learn more about frogs and how to protect them and, and sort of mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, these kids over and over again. Um, when I ask them, like, what is your advice for other kids who want to make a difference? This is like the same thing over and over. They all say, we may be young, but age does not define us. We just need to take action. Like it's the over and over again. They're all saying like, if I can, if a kid like me can do it, you can do it too. Um, it just starts with one small step. So think about, you know, what you like to do. Like you said, I like cats. Okay. You like cats, go to your, go to your local animal shelter and ask them how you can help. I mean, you need, might need to bring a parent with you or a, a teacher with you, but um, I have several kids who just collect animal supplies and they drop them off at the animal shelter. Um, so yeah, there's just think about what you are passionate about. If you are passionate about trees, go plant some trees, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's like, think about what you're passionate about or maybe even what your strength is, what you're, what you're good at. Um, if you're good at running, I have a girl in book two who, um, her name is Ada and she loves running. So she runs, she's five years old. Um, she's from the UK and, uh, she runs and then, um, people pledge to her when she runs and she doesn't do like, she doesn't sign up for marathons. She just runs through her neighborhood. But she mm -hmm. runs miles and then people pledge to her and then she donates all the money to uh, the Childhood um, <clears throat> Liver Disease Foundation because she was born with liver disease. And she's raised over like $70,000 just by doing wow. that. So because she likes to run, they've turned that into a way to give back. So like I said, every kid is in here is saying you don't need to be, you know, you don't need to be rich. You don't need to be, it doesn't need to be a huge thing. Go to the beach mm -hmm. and pick up garbage. Um, my kids went around our neighborhood and picked up bags of garbage um, last spring. It doesn't need to be like a huge thing. Any little thing you do can make a difference. And then you can inspire other people to come along and do the same thing. I think one of the common threads with each of these stories is that they had families that saw their passion and, and saw what they were interested in and helped them to reach their goals or, or to start, you know, their mm -hmm. organization or whatever. Um, 
We are live on YouTube and, and uh, it's, it's a fairly new channel and, and new series that we're doing here at the Coffee and Kidlet Show. So if this kind of content content interests you, please hit the subscribe button so you can follow along. I've got some awesome authors that are coming up in the next few weeks, but um, we do have some, some comments and questions coming in. Um, this is actually from Carly Valentine, who is the author of Extra Special Heart. She's, she's been um, Hi, Carly. My, my one live person the past couple of weeks. Carly is so <laughs> well, supportive. Okay. She's awesome. Yes. Yeah. So she's asking, what is the reading level for these books? Yeah, I would say that's a great question um, that I get asked a lot. Um, so if kids are going to read them themselves, I would say because of the vocabulary, we do have um, some of the trickier words bolded and defined in each feature. So because of the vocabulary and how many words are on the page, um, I I recommend, and I have asked several teachers. So I always tell authors, if you don't know the reading level or you don't know what age your books are good for, go into a teacher group, post a couple of the pages and ask, ask them, say, hey, what, what age do you think this is good for? And so um, I say about second grade up to about maybe sixth or seventh grade. Um, but I tell teachers, you can, obviously you can read the books to younger kids. You know, the younger kids are interested too. They just might not be able to handle some of those bigger words. And I would say also that the kids that you introduce in these books, they range anywhere from maybe five years up to yeah. now young adults. So, um, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so she also asks highly, no, that's not a question. How do you recommend our authors needing help to get this offering on her Kickstarter? Um, oh, yeah, so, because I have some uh, on the Kickstarter, I have a couple author packages. So I'm an author yeah. coach, too. And so if there's people out there who need help, you know, with a Kickstarter or marketing or anything, yeah, there's a package on there that they can that they can pledge to. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you're watching the replay, you can find the link to the Kickstarter again in the description. And then she has one more question for us. Ha ha, it's me again. <laughs> you know how I love asking questions. Now that this series is coming to a close. Uh -huh. <laughs> Supposedly. Maybe. Uh, what is coming next for you, from you? And, and I do ask this question later in the interview, but um, go ahead and, and answer that. What's next? Well, I don't know quite yet. Um, my plan is for the until December, I'm just going to focus on getting the rest of the series done and published because um, book so book five is still on its way to my house from the printer. So once these get to my house, I'm going to be focused on sending these out to my Kickstarter backers from April and getting this on Amazon. And then um, book six and seven are the ones that I'm kickstarting right now. So for the next two weeks, I'm highly focused on getting these funded. This one's at the printer being um, putting, you know, getting initially printed right now. And then uh, Travis and I are finishing up book seven and getting that ready for the printer this week. Uh, so once I get all of those books, there's gonna be a focus on just getting them my Kickstarter backers, um, getting them on Amazon and getting them like launched basically out into the world and really focusing on marketing those books um, for Christmas. Um, along with the Cami Kangaroo books, I've kind of uh, neglected those in the last year and a half. And it shows because I just can't do everything. It's too hard. So I've put like 90% of my author attention uh, and um, work into Young Changemakers. And I've really kind of neglected my Cami series. And so I need to uh, refocus my efforts on that too. So I guess for the next uh, six months, that's my plan. And then, you know, we'll see where it goes. Like I'm going to, I want to do another Cammy and Wyatt book. Um, and I don't know about the, what we're doing with young change makers yet. We'll see what happens. So it's see, kind of up in the air, right. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been sort of announcing on social media, the success behind the first book. Um, I, I just looked this morning and it's still within the top 2,500 books uh -huh. um, on Amazon in 
a total of 12 million books that are available right now. Yeah. Um, what do you attribute to the success? You know, it's interesting because the other books in the series are doing well, but that one, I don't know. It's like, because I feel like the other, I feel like the other books, they're, they all so they all have the same content as the first book, but the first mm -hmm. book has really just taken off. And I don't know if it's because it's the first book in the series and people see that it's book one. And so they're like, oh, I'm going to buy this first book. Um, and then if I like it, you know, I'll kind of get the other ones as I can or what um, I did have when I launched it, I did have a, uh, a launch team. So I try to make a launch team with every book that I launch. And basically what I do is I have built up an audience of teachers and parents and homeschooling parents who um, who really uh, are inspired by the series and who really like it. And um, I have a Facebook group and I also have um, an email list of people who when I launch a book, they will. Um, I will give them the free, they will get the free ebook and then they will leave a review. So I feel like during that week, that launch week, I'm really focused on traffic to Amazon. Um, I also send out books to, I have a lot of um, Instagram influencers. So people on Instagram who are teachers or parents um, of kids in this uh, age level. And I send them a book and they will post about it on their social media during launch week. So that kind of kickstarts it on Instagram. And then um, I'm just really highly focused on posting everywhere my Amazon link because I tell everybody, you know, Amazon gives you like a week to two weeks where they will advertise your book for free. They'll send out emails to, you know, millions of people like, oh, you might like this book. See what Stacey Bauer published now. And they'll put ads for you on, on Facebook. And I see them from my author friends. So, and they're, they're posted by Amazon. And so um, Amazon does this. They, they want to make money off of you and they want to see if your book is going to sell. And so you really have to capitalize on that. Like you have to take advantage of that and think, okay, Amazon's giving me a push. I need to take advantage of that and really push my book. So I have the launch team. I have the Instagram influencers that are posting. I'm posting about it in all the different places that I'm a part of. Um, and I'm also running very aggressive Amazon ads. <laughs> so um, I understand I have been doing Amazon ads for four years and it's really hard. I tell other authors it's really hard uh, seeing Amazon spending your money. But you have to remember that, you know, if you're competing against 12 million books. So if you just put your book on there and don't do anything, unless you're famous, um, people probably aren't going to see it unless you have mm -hmm. like, you know, tons of active followers on social media or you're already famous. Um, you have to run those Amazon ads. So I have really researched Amazon ads. And so I think to answer your question, I think it's a combination of um, a book that is uh, really needed right now. Um, the book cover is excellent. Uh, the in, inside is professionally done. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, I have the Amazon ads going and I have a, a very um, aggressive launch strategy. So I think all of that has, and, and I've kept it going. Um, I still have people posting about it on social media, um, about the series. And so when people look up Young Changemakers, I'm targeting that keyword. And so my this book comes up. And I tell people, you know, you might have to spend a lot of money and time launching these books, but you want to get your ranking up there because it's a lot easier to keep it up there than it is to launch it and, and not spend any time or money and have your ranking be down here and try to get it up. That's just really hard. So um, the, the better ranked your book is, the more people are going to see it organically because Amazon's going to just show it more. They're selling it. They want to sell more. They're going to push it higher. People are going to see it more and the sales are just going to come in organically too. So the Amazon ads and the organic stuff kind of work together. Yeah, I, I agree. And it, it is a combination of your 
pushing and marketing through Amazon ads and, and social media, but it's also the content of the book and even the title itself, making a difference. That's, I mean, that's such a catchphrase, you might say, for this younger generation. And we can see that because here you are, you've got a whole series of, of kids who want to make a difference. And um, it's, it is needed right now after the past few years that we have gone through and, um, yeah, kids want to make a difference. And, and, uh, so I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, if there was one message from the whole series for kids, what would it be? Well, I always say you're never too young to make a difference because, um, I hear that, like I said, I hear that over and over again from every kid I've interviewed. And every time I go to a school visit, kids will say, well, I'm too young. You know, my, the adults are telling me, oh, you're just wait till you're older. You don't need to wait. You're not too young. Uh, go do something. Something doesn't need to be a big thing. Just take one little step and um, you're already making a difference. So yeah, that is the main message mm -hmm. I think. And that's why I titled it young change makers because they mm -hmm. are young. They were young when they started, um, but they, they've made a difference, whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, you're not too young. I see that, <clears throat> excuse me, I see that so often in the series, you know, we have advice from the kids in each feature and so many of them say you're never too young to make a difference. Yes. Yes. Don't let them tell you you're too young. Yes. Yeah, it's repeated over and over again. And I think that's, yep. that's awesome. I have a um, lot of kids that I interviewed that have like these girls, I know I'm talking a lot, so cut me off if I'm taking too long, but um. Isabel and Maladi are from Indonesia, and they were when they were 12 and 10, they uh, really wanted to make a difference. In Indonesia, they found out that is the second their country is the second largest polluter of the ocean with plastics, and so they wanted to do something. So they organized this huge beach cleanup, the biggest one ever in the history of the country, and they went out and picked up all this trash. But they their ultimate goal was to put to ban. Um, plastic, single use plastic bags. And so at the age of 12 and 10, they are lobbying and petitioning the government to ban plastic bags. And the government is kind of like, okay, whatever kid, you're, you guys are kids, you know, nothing about business. You, this, you're not going to get this banned. And you know, they would push them off and kind of laugh at them, but the girls kept going at it. They kept, you know, talking and getting out in their communities and they were passing out cloth reusable bags. And in 2019, they got plastic bags banned. <laughs> so that is like one, I know, isn't that amazing? That's like one success story that I just love. And now they have like 60 teams worldwide of other kids in their, their um, nonprofit is called Bye Bye Plastic Bags. And so they have all these different chapters worldwide who are doing the same thing. And we see that here in the US, there are several states who have banned plastic bags. Um, people have to bring in reusable cloth bags. And it's just, like I said, it, it came from an idea. They started, they saw the plastic clogging up the rivers and the streets. And they were like, this is not okay. And they started out by just picking up garbage. And now look, their whole country is has banned plastic bags. So it just shows that kids can do this. Right. And, you know, the whole series is some of these kids, they're not, making these huge world altering things like like this couple that or these uh siblings that you described mm -hmm. they're some of them are very simple they're starting a bake sale or they're doing yes. a lemonade stand or yep. you know and i think that's that's the key is to just start small start somewhere yep. start you know stop doing plastic bags as a family yes. or yes. you know go pick up trash on the beach mm -hmm. um Let's see. Uh, Carly has another comment here. I'm a huge believer in you get back what you give. I feel like oh, this wow. is a huge part of She's your success. So sweet. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> um, but that's that's exactly the truth. Um, and and it's, it's just so inspiring. Um, one more question for you. What would you say? I didn't give you this question beforehand, but what would you say to other authors who are considering writing a book right now? Well, just like these kids are saying, I would say to just take a step. So it can be 
really overwhelming uh, getting into the self-publishing world. I know from experience, and we we all know. I mean, you ask any self-published author, and they'll be like, "Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing either. This is overwhelming." Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's so much. Like, I talk to other authors, and I post on Facebook, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, this is too much. I can't do this." And I just say, break it down. So get your idea, write the story. Um, and then something that really helped me was joining these Facebook author groups. And I have I have a lot of good friends now who are authors um, and we help each other. So if I need an editor, I'll ask for recommendations. You know, don't just go out and find a random editor. You want to find someone that's, you know, professional and won't take advantage of you and, and um, charge you too much money or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, just joining the, the Facebook groups, I think is good for support for, uh, doing research on what comes next. So what should I do? Asking questions, sharing your own, uh, strategies and advice and getting recommendations and, and, um, just cultivating those author relationships has been huge for me. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to ask you, um, and this says what's next, but let's just ignore that. What, how can people... <laughs> How can people contact you? Because I know you have a lot going on. You you are coaching other authors. You do author visits. How can people contact you? So I would say the best way, there's a few different ways. Um, if you just, my author name is on the screen, Stacy C. Bauer. And that's my name. That's my website, stacycbauer.com. Um, that's my social media page. If you just, if you Google it, if you just type in Stacy C. Bauer, you'll find me on Google. And uh, mm -hmm. I have a contact form on my web page that you can just fill out. It goes right to my email. And then, yeah, I will respond within like 24 hours. Um, they can find me on Facebook and Instagram too. Um, but yeah, I would say the website is because they can just type in my name. If you remember, you know, Cami Kangaroo, if you type that in, you'll find me that way. Um, youngchangemakersbooks.com actually goes right to my uh, Young Changemakers page. So you can find me that way too. So yeah, there's... There's lots of different ways, but my author name, I think, is probably the easiest way. And you do have the Kickstarter going on right now. Yep. I just want to mention that one last time. The link is in the description of this video. Go check out the Kickstarter. Order that pack of paperback books, seven yes, books in the series. <laughs> That's right. It's a very short flash sale of those paperback books, only $48. Now, you have raised, I think, about $150 just while we've been Ooh, on the show here, hey, if, I, if I'm looking at it correctly. But um, so that's pretty cool. And um, just really excited for you, Stacy, and and this whole series. I, I've I've been sort of a, an advocate for it ever since the beginning, not just because of my involvement in it, but just because I really believe in the message behind it. So very well done, Stacy. Um I want to invite everyone to join me. Now, next week, I don't have an author interview signed up, but I'm actually thinking about doing a video on how to prepare for a recession as an author. And I've got some really great information to share for other authors about that. So if that's interesting to you, please leave a comment below and let me know. Um, I'm not sure yet if it's going to be a live show or if I'll pre-record it, but um, I, I think I have some really great information for other authors about how to prepare for a recession. And then in two weeks, I have Christina Furnival on the show. And uh, let me get rid of the screen share here. I've got this book, Fear Not by Christina Furnival. And uh, we'll be talking about how to face your fear and anxiety head on with kids. And so that's a, that's going to be a really interesting topic. And then I'll have her on and again in a few weeks to talk about how to set boundaries for healthy friendships. So she'll be on the show twice, actually, within the next couple of, uh, or the next month or so. Um, so join me in two weeks for that. You'll see a link in the description for that interview so that you can be notified when we go live. Um, Stacy, once again, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. We were talking about how we, we chat almost every day on Facebook, but we haven't talked face to face very often. Very so, first time, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it was great seeing you virtually and actually talking like face to face. So, and, and Travis has been amazing through this whole series, too. I definitely could not have done any of this without you. So, it's been great. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, have a great day, and we'll see you next week.